Good morning, good morning. We're starting off with something a bit novel today. We're going to be going backwards. Because there's a car in front of me. So I can't reverse out. But here I go. You don't really need reversing cameras. Honestly, cars have reversed for centuries without reversing cameras. And reversing cameras can't show you cars coming along the road, can they? Like these four. There you go. I find wing mirrors are much more accurate, even after dark. But your car might be different. Perhaps you've got a spotlight on the back of your car, I don't know. Uh. Yeah, so, I hope you're well. The uh, Friday, last Friday, we went up to the uh, British Dental Industries Association exhibition, formerly known as the British Dental Trade Association. It's uh, altogether a smaller affair than it always, you know, it used to be. It was the ma massive trade fair for everybody in the dental profession, and uh, those are in the days when it was run by Tony Reid under the auspices of uh, the same body, but they call themselves the British Dental Trade Association, and. Uh, it was the only dental exhibition really and then what happened was uh, the British Dental Association that used to have an annual meeting which was funded largely by the Department of Health by who subsidised all the vocational trainees to go uh, then decided to have an exhibition tack on and then dentistry which is I think Ken Finlinison if I remember correctly and who, you know, tried to, how can I put it, tried to expand his sphere of uh, business activities to include absolutely everything within the profession, including trying to uh, publish a private fees guide, uh, which was really up to then the domain of the General Dental Practitioners Association, and also tried to uh, take on exhibitions and uh, you know and so oh hello oh, I've made a mistake haven't I I've decided to come through the puddle of doom fortunately it's not that big and I'm the only one going through it oh that's bright yeah so um, and I said to <coughs> Tony Reeves an interesting guy very nice, very sociable. Once a year, he used to hold a dinner for all the dental press, which was always really, really well done. All organized by a woman called Rebecca Evans, who if you are lucky enough to employ Rebecca Evans, you've got someone there who really understands the, her job and uh, did an excellent, I, you know, I've got a lot of, uh, Stories from when the time Tony Reid was running the BDTA. They're another like they're like the technicians, you know. They wanted to. They were a bit worried about their perceived their their place in the <clears throat> relative to dentists. So that's why they upgraded themselves from a trade to an industry. They were doing perfectly well as the BDTA and had very good brand recognition, and then. Uh, you know, decided that they, they, they would, they were, they thought they were a bit more important than, than the word trade. Uh, like trade is tradesmen, isn't it? And so they didn't like that. So they were like, oh. So they upgraded themselves, which I think was silly because they lost all that brand recognition. And at the same time, they failed to um, monopolize on their early mover status and their network effect of their exhibition um, and I suggested to Tony that uh, you know he made a condition of exhibiting at the BDTA exhibition that 
people signed a, a waiver which prevented them from exhibiting like three months either side of the anywhere else you know um, he never took me up on that so now the BDIA is very much a smaller affair uh, I offered to uh, I said to him that uh, the BDIA would be uh, an exhibition would be much better served if they had an app where people could register through the app and they could maintain an up-to-date map of the stands and uh, you know which would click through to all the exhibitors and a directory of what was being sold and who was selling it and where to go for that and, uh, you know it's a classic IT application a classic uh, way to do it but again he was like he didn't have a he probably had a Blackberry at the time he wasn't really into feature phones and I remember standing next to him at a bar and showing him how, how to because I said to him like you know this is you can get websites up on these on these phones and he said he said, well, that's ridiculous. He says, well, I can't read that. That's, that's ridiculously tiny, you know. And I said, no, if you, if you pinch, you can zoom in. So if you want to read, if you want it magnified, then you just pinch and zoom in. He was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but then, uh, he then, uh, we found out a couple of years later that he uh, thought it was a brilliant idea, but he hadn't asked us to do it for him he asked someone else so uh, he just sort of nicked our idea so we've got dentistry nicking our ideas on the fee guides and we had the BDTA nicking our ideas on the show guides and but then that's what that's what services you expect that you know there's a uh, with goods here's a little mini lesson with goods you can uh, do things like uh, patents and stuff like that uh, and protect your uh, physical goods, but with uh, ideas and services, it's very much more difficult. Uh, to, with uh, books, for example, there's copyright and uh, the trademarks and stuff like that. So to a certain extent, you can you can protect tra uh, protect trademarks, but um, you can't uh, really. The only way to uh, be successful as a service provider is to continually evolve, to continually um, stay ahead of the competition. And if someone comes and says to you, "No, you know, I want this printed in colour," uh, but my mate down the road said he can do it for me and he can print in colour as well, then you know you have to say, "Yeah, well, that's right." I mean, you know, printing in colour is something that everyone was, is doing now. We did it ten years ago. Everyone's doing it now. Now we're doing binding and stapling you know in addition so um, and one way to do that is to obviously is to constantly innovate but the other way to do it is to subcontract your services to the free market in other words don't just do stuff internally uh, you know try and take on contracts from other businesses and we're going to be involved in that because uh, we have bought some equipment at the show which will allow us to uh, because you know uh, <coughs> just a quick background my lab technicians join in Border Force all my sources say that Border Force is uh, pays decent money because it's a horrible job it's dead boring and uh, a lot of people who go there come back but um Anyway, he's going. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a large amount of the uh, easier lab work in-house. So we're still going to send out dental processing and pounds and bridges, but uh, we're going to do everything from casting, special impressions, uh, special trays, uh, bites, triants, stuff like that. So what then we can then decide is whether or not we want to subcontract our lab out to other dentists and that actually is not so much of a problem because um, we can probably do the work it's just that it's a question of just collecting it picking it up and, and dropping it off and uh, 
we uh, what what happens then is that you have to charge a market rate. That's the idea. And then what you do is you can then charge yourself internally the market rate because you know what the what the rate is. Um, so that so what you do is you then you don't end up doing internally a job which is on which you're making a stonking loss, uh, which you could subcontract out. Um, so no, you know so that's the theory behind it anyway. And the theory works. So what I'm saying is that it works, and that's the theory behind it. So. What we're going to do is we're going to build up our capacity for laboratory work in-house and then see if we can't um, attract uh, work from other dentists in the area. But the problem is, like, you know, we're going to have to perhaps take on another member of staff, one half-time equivalent, for example, who's going to do the pickups and the drop-offs and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and the lab work. But it's quite, uh, you know, it's quite remunerative. If you're charging, say, fifty pounds for a mouth guard and you're doing ten a day, uh, then you know th that's easily pays for the uh, wages and the uh, and the equipment. So, BDIA, uh, twenty-five pounds a park. So not cheap, cheap, but. Uh, Okay, and um, we drove up there. If you park outside the entrance, you go in. I, you know, I mean, it's nothing like if you went there 20 years ago, you wouldn't recognize it because it's, it's a small exhibition now. And you get 10 phone calls and 20 emails just reminding you. I mean, they really do overdo it with the uh, social media side of things. Um, you know, I mean, I was really, honestly, I would have banned them. From my inbox, I would have, you know, I would have literally said said it was junk if I wasn't worried that they might tell me something that I might want to know, like it had been cancelled or something. But uh, you know, it was like only three days to go, two days to go, all that sort of crap. So anyway, we all, all in all, we had an enjoyable half a day there, I would say, because we. It only takes you half a day to go round, and that included having a chat with um, everybody that we wanted to have a chat with. We did have a little meeting pre-going, and we decided what we were interested in. We were interested in digital scanning technology, handheld x-ray technology. Uh, what else? Uh, any sort of uh, laboratory, you know, since we're setting up a lab, anything that we could do in house to uh, ease the uh, lab side of things. So, for instance, we've already got a heated wax knife. Um, so, uh, intro cameras, which I would like. Uh, and then uh, just anything else like the odd impulse purchase. I did buy a, a 60 quid's worth of Shotlander burrs. Because uh, I like the look of them, they look particularly uh, effective. Um, don't be afraid, by the way, if you're, uh, you know, I, I, as an experienced practitioner, most of what I buy is is pretty coarse in terms of uh, diamond. Uh, I don't really use fine diamonds at all, if, you know, much if at all. The reason is that. Uh, it depends on your touch. If you've got a heavy touch, then don't use heavy diamonds. Because you know? these things are like Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. They will go through pretty much anything they touch. Uh, so if you've are if you uh, got a shaky hand or uh, you're not entirely sure that uh, what you're doing, then, then stick with the finer diamonds. But uh, um, when you, you know, your first 10,000 crowns are the trickiest once you've done a few then uh, you should be able to uh, you, you know what the end result is you know in the same way as uh, uh, Michelangelo looked at a lump of, of granite and saw David inside it and it was just a case of chipping off the bits that that weren't David to um, to liberate the statue so uh, one thing I did uh, 
see when I was wandering around. I saw a couple of the old Star Wars. Someone came up and said hello to me because they watched the YouTube videos, which is nice. Uh, I saw John Milne there, the uh, ex-chair or chair of the Care Quality Commission, whatever, if he's still chair, I don't know, I suppose he is. Um, the chief dental officer, or the officer, the chief dental officer, it's called now Octo, is now a, is a massive thing and they have a massive pavilion there. And they have next to them, they have a, their own lecture theatre, which is of equal size, you know, so massive. And uh, this is your tax dollars paying for all this, you know. And uh, I just wandered around and there was some big crowd, probably 150 people, standing room only in the aisles and uh, there was a panel of about eight people sitting down and I just walked in on the tail end of this lecture which I presume was about working on the NHS I presume because the girl and I call her a girl because she was obviously just postgraduate um, who was summarizing said you know and now we need to draw this panel to a close and um, but I just, you know, before you go, I'd just like to remind you that the NHS is the jewel in the nation's crown and a big part of uh, what we value so much about um, this country and is unique and is uh, helps millions of people every year and uh, it's worth fighting for and, uh, you know, and I was just walking past, John Milne was listening to this and I thought, and the audience itself was were in, was in his twenties, and just in that ten seconds, just so to, to blundering into the end part of that, I just to, told me so much about the NHS and how where it's going and how it's going. They are, for the most part, propaganda. They are, for the most part, telling people about a service that doesn't exist in real life. They are, for the most part, uh, benefiting, what's the word, um, taking advantage of these young practitioners' lack of experience and naivety and uh, uh, to urge them into a service which, is, which most of the senior practitioners know is clearly dysfunctional and in my opinion would be a waste of their professional career to pursue it for 10 years, let's say, and then and then find that they, you know, uh, really are only able to practice dentistry in the way that they were trained out with the NHS. And I honestly felt like uh, <laughs> standing at the back and shouting, what a load of cods follow. What, you know, I have seen uh, so much poor work and a consistent deterioration in the quality of the work in the last 10 years or so. The NHS is clearly dysfunctional. The NHS dentistry has clearly collapsed. Um, NHS has collapsed. When a and E's not working, you know the NHS has collapsed. I've seen bridges, you know, that are supported at one end. I have seen NHS money going on mouth guards because they generate UDAs and they only take five minutes. I, my technician is complaining and part of the, uh, you know, I would say part of the reason why he's so, uh, his morale is so low is because of the number of dentists now who are just sending him an impression and, say, and a shade and saying, take this straight to finish. No bite, no trying, nothing. Just straight to finish and with the, the sort of the overwhelming uh, idea is just stuff something in there, like in the old days when people used to put silver points in root fillings, just something you can x-ray that fulfills the, the DEB's requirement of uh, a, a, some root treatment in some root somewhere qualifies for payment. And some plastic in a mouth somewhere qualifies as a denture. And I said to him, you know, how do they fit these things? And he said, you just, they just grind them. Actually, he was a bit less polite about what he said, but, he, but basically he just said they, they just grind them until the, the, um, they're clear of the bite and the patients, you know, walk away with this this thing, which is probably <laughs> not much better than than uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, gutta perca. 
uh, dentures, you know, or the, the ones that were made out of the teeth of the soldiers that fell at Waterloo. Probably not even as good as that. Uh, and uh, it reminded me of, um, uh, there's a game, Call of Duty game, where you play the side of the Russians and you're being urged to urged on into the fight and everywhere you go someone's saying forward forward you know here's a gun without a bullet here's a bullet without a gun knowing that 50% of you are going to be slaughtered straight away therefore a few of you will probably get a bullet and a gun and uh, it just that just reminded me of that it was just like onwards 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 to these young practitioners onwards into the slaughter but it's rude to heckle, isn't it? It's rude to, you know. And besides, you know, who was it who said, Sun Tzu said never interrupt the enemy when he's making a mistake? So why, why would I heckle? Why would I heckle? Okay, anyway, nice to talk to you. Have a lovely day. Bye.